Medicine for the Layman, a lecture series presented by the Clinical Center of the National Institutes of Health. The subject of this lecture is cholesterol, diet, and heart disease. The speaker is Dr. H. Brian Brewer, who is chief of the Molecular Disease Branch, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Dr. Brewer. Uh, this evening we're going to be discussing cholesterol and as Dr. Liss had mentioned it's a hot topic and we'll try to review tonight uh, what we know about cholesterol and what you've undoubtedly been reading what is good cholesterol and what is bad cholesterol and what we know now about the process of hardening of the arteries or atherosclerosis and uh, what we know now are risk factors for the development of uh, hardening of the arteries and heart disease. Now it's uh, it's very clear that uh, everyone, I think, has heard about cholesterol, and uh, there is clearly a lot of uh, information about cholesterol. But I'd like just briefly, in the beginning, to show you what cholesterol and the other major lipid triglyceride are, and some of the foods that contain them, uh, so that you can become aware of what uh, these particular lipids uh, are. This is cholesterol. Uh, cholesterol is a complex heterocyclic compound uh, as you can see here, which is present in a variety of different foods that we eat and is present in uh, the body in several different organs and in both the cell membrane of the organ and this structure, cholesterol, is also involved in many of the uh, other different uh, compounds of the body such as the steroids from the adrenal gland and uh, the sex hormones. So this is a heterocyclic compound that is made both by the body and taken in in a variety of different foods that we eat. Now cholesterol, which is present principally in uh, many of the uh, food products and also in uh, several of the uh, different types of meats that we eat. And normally the cholesterol in the average American's diet, which we'll come back to later on, varies somewhere between 600 and 800 milligrams per day. And if you were going to eat what people would now consider a better level of cholesterol, it's about 300 milligrams a day. Well, you can see from this list of the amount of milligrams of cholesterol that are actually in the different foodstuffs, if you have two eggs in the morning, uh, you've already exceeded what the usual amount of cholesterol that is recommended now that you would take. If you have two eggs in the morning and go out to Gino's uh, at lunch, then you're in, uh, if you start counting up the amount of uh, milligrams of cholesterol that you take in, you can see that it'll mount up very quickly in the variety of the other foodstuffs, as you can see here, give you an idea of what amount of cholesterol that we're talking about that really can be in the diet, and particularly in a diet when one is not looking or not thinking about the amount of cholesterol that's actually in the diet. There's another uh, major lipid that we eat every day, which really hasn't received the publicity of cholesterol, and that's the triglyceride molecule and triglycerides. In reality, this is the kind of fat that you see when you're eating your steak and cutting off the fat, uh, and this is the uh, lipid that is in your fat cells and stored in the body, and this is called triglyceride. And triglyceride is a molecule which has a backbone of glycerol, which is shown here, and then fatty acids which are attached to the triglycerides at these points. And again, there's been a lot of uh, discussions over the last uh, one or two years, and really dating back as long as 10 to 15 years ago, about the type of fatty acids that we're eating, that is polyunsaturated versus saturated fatty acids. And these are the fatty acids that are attached onto, for example, these triglyceride molecules. Again, if you consider how much fat that we take in in the form of triglyceride, uh, most Americans are taking anywhere from uh, 60, let's say 80 grams of fat per day in their diet. And if you would reduce your fat intake to what again appears to be the more ideal level, that is about 30 to 40 grams per day, you can again see about how much uh, fat that you would get from individual portions of the, of the foods that are listed here including hamburgers and frankfurters and so forth. So if you go to uh, McDonald's and get two eggs in the morning and you go to Gino's at uh, lunch and then at Roy Rogers on the way home, uh, you can see that the amount of lipid that you can take in in a given day uh, can be uh, really quite high. 
and as you, I think, all know, that the amount of uh, fat intake that, and cholesterol that uh, the average American takes in is really uh, enormous compared to other countries, and we'll come back to it. Some countries are higher, and it appears to correlate with the degree of cardiovascular disease that uh, these different populations have. Now, the two major lipids that we've talked about, cholesterol and triglyceride, are taken in uh, the body and have to be transported around in the plasma. Now, neither one of these two lipids, that is, either the cholesterol or the triglycerides, are soluble in the plasma or serum or in the blood. And so they have to be transported around in what we've shown here as a boat. So they have to have a vehicle to transport our friends now, cholesterol and triglyceride, around in the plasma to transport them to the various sites where they're going to be utilized. The boat here has a protein, which is another component, and this uh, boat, which is made up of these four components, is called a lipoprotein. So the cholesterol and triglyceride are not free in the plasma, but are transported around in the form of boats, which carry them, and these boats are called lipoproteins. And the <coughs> protein moiety here is shown to be the captain, and it's directing the lipoprotein to go to the various different tissues uh, so that the cholesterol and triglyceride can be transported uh, around to the different sites which they'll be utilized. Now, if you would take, an, and, uh, t take a sample of blood from an individual and then look at the uh, blood under a powerful microscope or by electron microscopy, what you would see is a collection of particles, and these are our boats. These are a variety of different sized particles which are lipoproteins, which range from molecules that are almost 1,000 angstroms to ones that are very small. And we have a polydispersed collection of the plasma lipoproteins that are circulating around with the major lipids, cholesterol and triglyceride, being transported to different sizes and uh, sites in the body. Now with this uh, different polydispersed collection of lipoproteins, we can begin to separate this group of lipoproteins, and one method to do that is to separate them by their size, and as you can see, they're really quite heterogeneous in size, and so if we separate them by their size and hydrated density, we see that there are basically four different types of lipoproteins that we have in the plasma. Uh, there are groups of particles, which are lar the largest particles that you saw, which are termed chylomicrons. The next largest group of particles are called very low density lipoproteins, or VLDL. The next group of particles are low density lipoproteins, or LDL. And the smallest group of particles are called high density lipoproteins, or HDL. Now if, as I'm sure that several of you have done over the years, someone measures your plasma triglycerides or measures your cholesterol, what they're measuring is the cholesterol moiety, which is shown here in yellow, on all of these different particles. And the triglyceride, again, is measured on this particle and this particle. When you, when you measure the triglyceride level in the plasma, so you're measuring all of the particles and the two lipids, the cholesterol and triglyceride, that are in the four different boats that are going around in plasma. Now, in general, approximately 75% of the cholesterol in the plasma is attached to, to the low-density lipoproteins. Approximately 15% is attached to the high-density lipoproteins, and the other 10 to 12% are attached to the chylomicrons and very low-density lipoproteins. Now, we'll come back to this in a moment, and this is important because I'm sure some of you have been reading in Time Magazine or Reader's Digest about the different types of lipoproteins that are there and good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, and it relates to the cholesterol that's on these different groups of lipoprotein particles. The chylomicrons and the very low-density lipoproteins contain essentially all of the triglyceride in the plasma, so that all of the triglyceride is carried in these two types of particles and the cholesterol on all four, but approximately 75% of it on the low-density lipoproteins, or LDL. 
Now, what are the function of these four types of lipoproteins? And basically, how do these lipoproteins fit together in a scheme of transporting cholesterol and triglyceride around in the plasma? And what are the disease states associated with these different types of lipoproteins? Now, as we mentioned, that if we start from the plasma, that the food that you've eaten contains cholesterol and triglyceride, and it goes into the intestine and is present in the intestine in the form of cholesterol and triglyceride. It is absorbed through the intestinal wall. The apoproteins are added as part of the boat and the phospholipids. And basically, we have the production of a lipoprotein particle that is carrying the cholesterol and triglyceride from the diet. And this is shown schematically here, is from the intestine now, we have the, particularly the triglyceride and the cholesterol, which are transported into the plasma on the chylomicron. Now, the chylomicron's major function is to transport the dietary cholesterol and triglyceride to other sites where it can be utilized uh, both for energy sources and as a supply for cholesterol for other cells. So this is one of the first uh, of the, the particles that we'll now discuss, and that's the chylomicron. So that after you've eaten a meal at about three to four hours later, you get a large increase in the amount of chylomicrons in your plasma. And actually, if you would draw a plasma sample at that time, you can see that it's cloudy. And it's cloudy because of these very large particles that are transporting the dietary cholesterol and triglyceride uh, into the body. The body can also make cholesterol and triglyceride. It gets a certain percent from outside of the body and a certain percent from the inside of the body. And one of the major sites of synthesis in the body for cholesterol and triglyceride is the liver, shown schematically here. And so that the liver also makes particles, which are very similar, as we've seen, to the chylomicron and the very low density lipoproteins, both of these containing a large amount of triglyceride and some cholesterol. So that the function of the very low density lipoproteins is the transport of endogenous cholesterol and triglyceride as the chylomicrons are transporting exogenous or the foodstuff cholesterol and triglyceride uh, that we've eaten. Now these two groups of particles contain a large amount of triglyceride as we've seen and a certain amount of cholesterol and these boats circulate around in plasma and at the point uh, and at the point, uh, if you now look at what happens as you go around in the plasma, basically we have an enzyme which is called lipoprotein lipase. And this enzyme is able to metabolize the triglyceride and to cleave off the fatty acids from the triglyceride. And basically we have a metabolism of the lipoproteins where these particles were large particles containing a lot of triglycerides, where they undergo metabolism, where they lose their triglyceride, and you have a formation of what is called IDL, or the intermediate density lipoprotein, finally to the low density lipoprotein, or LDL. Now, the fatty acids that are metabolized off of the triglycerides by the enzyme lipase can be utilized for energy, or they can also be resynthesized in fat cells to be stored as energy in the form of uh, uh, fat in the uh, peripheral cells. This enzyme li uh, lipoprotein lipase is attached to, on the wall of the uh, blood vessels so that this metabolism where you have triglycerides being cleaved off of these particles gradually uh, makes a particle smaller and smaller and you have basically transported the triglycerides around to the body and utilized then them as an energy source and also as a storage for energy uh, in the rest of the body. Now the cholesterol is still in the same boat. It hasn't jumped out like the triglyceride has and as it goes down this cascade from VLDL to IDL, the LDL cholesterol is now in the low density lipoproteins or LDL. And you saw in one of the earlier slides that the major lipid in the low density lipoproteins in terms of cholesterol and triglyceride is the cholesterol. Now the cholesterol, uh, which is in the form of LDL, then is gradually taken up in the peripheral cells, such as the blood vessel wall, 
uh, the smooth muscle cell, the fibroblast, the muscle cells, and a variety of other cells in the body. And what the low-density lipoprotein does is supply the cholesterol for the cells so that they do not have to make their own cholesterol. So we've gone down a cascade where we have had a cycle from the liver transporting the cholesterol through this system to the peripheral cell, and the peripheral cell uses the cholesterol for making membranes, other functions that it has, and doesn't have to make its own endogenous cholesterol in the peripheral cell. So it acts as a storage uh, during the process here that is being transported, and then LDL is metabolized, uh, as shown here. Now you can see in this uh, pattern of uh, cascade from VLDL to LDL that basically it's going in one direction. That is, we're putting cholesterol in, for example, a cell in the wall of a blood vessel. So that we have now, uh, through a variety of different experiments in a variety of different labs around the country, identified that the cholesterol is being added to the peripheral cell by the low-density lipoproteins. As you can see, we've got one half of a cycle here. And it is now, as a result of a large number of studies, become clear that at least one role for the high-density lipoproteins may be to transport the cholesterol from the cell back to the liver so that you have a pool of cholesterol uh, that's in the cell. And we have the high-density lipoproteins, which then transport the cholesterol back to the liver because the liver is the only organ that we know of thus far that can really get rid of the cholesterol. So what we have now is a cycle where we have the cholesterol being taken to the peripheral cell, and one of the functions now postulated for HDL is to take the cholesterol back from the peripheral cell to the liver where you can get rid of the cholesterol. And with this system, now I think it will become clear of what uh, individuals have now been uh, talking about in terms of good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. Good cholesterol is a cholesterol that is attached to the high-density lipoproteins that's basically coming in this portion of the cycle, taking the cholesterol out of the cell back to the liver where it can then uh, be uh, taken out of the body. The cholesterol that's bad cholesterol is a cholesterol associated with the low-density lipoproteins, which is putting cholesterol basically into the cell. And this is the, uh, the cholesterol that was uh, riding on the uh, black horse in the article in the Reader's Digest, and this is the cholesterol that's riding on the white horse in terms of HDL. Now, as a result of this, you can see that there's a great deal of interest in what things tend to elevate the low-density lipoproteins, and therefore the cholesterol and the low-density lipoprotein particles and the things that will tend to elevate HDL cholesterol because they tend to be a negative risk factor. And we'll come back to in a moment that, that the low-density lipoproteins are the cholesterol that is, is associated when you have a high cholesterol and you have an increased incidence of cardiovascular disease. This is a positive risk factor, whereas elevations of HDL cholesterol have now been shown to be a negative risk factor, and we'll return to this in a moment. Now that we've briefly reviewed the lipoproteins and the lipoprotein particles uh, that uh, are transporting the cholesterol and triglyceride, the question is, what happens when this system does not work appropriately? And we have basically cardiovascular disease, or uh, there are several names for it, atherosclerosis, arteriosclerosis, or hardening of the arteries. These are processes which uh, are well known, I think, to everyone and are associated as a major cause of cardiovascular disease in the American population. And that and cancer represent one of the major causes of death uh, uh, in this country as well as around the world. Now, what really is going on uh, with atherosclerosis and what really is the process? If this is a normal artery that's shown here on the left, Basically, the, this is a nice uh, division or bifurcation of the artery, and there's no impedance to blood flow uh, as the blood goes along the artery. In an artery that has atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries, basically you have a narrowing of the artery, as shown here, in which there is a gradual narrowing of the artery where there is a decreased amount of blood flow than, that can go through 
a given artery. And the, and the cells in this artery are filled with cholesterol. And if we now take and look at a uh, side of what would be happening in the artery, we see that this is a normal artery here. In an artery with atherosclerosis, or hardening of the arteries, it gradually gets, gets filled with cholesterol-laden cells. Some cells die, and the reason that it's called hardening of the arteries is that you actually get calcium deposits in the cholesterol-rich area uh, in the vessel so that it actually becomes calcified very much like bone, and that's where the term hardening of the arteries uh, came from, or calcium in the arteries. You have a breakdown of this uh, vessel so that a lot of the lipoproteins which are in the plasma come through here. You get, have an increase in the number of cells, particularly the smooth muscle cells that line the wall of the blood vessel, and you have a lot of scar tissue that can form. So the effect of atherosclerosis is to gradually narrow the artery and to impede the blood flow. Now, I'm going to show you a series of slides which will put the process of atherosclerosis in basically what happens in a period of probably in normal man over a period of about 20 years. And this is a normal artery. This is a coronary artery, one of the arteries that supplies the heart with its blood supply. And it's important to note that atherosclerosis does not have one single cause, but has a variety of different causes and several different disease processes end up with atherosclerosis. And the other important point is that atherosclerosis takes a long time. It's a process that goes on for years, and I think as probably several of you have read, when they looked at, the, uh, at autopsies of Korean War veterans um, which uh, had been killed in action, and they found that approximately of those American soldiers, approximately 30% of them had a 15% narrowing of, this, uh, of their arteries, their coronary arteries, and their average age was 22. So this is a process that takes years to develop and gradually will uh, accumulate in the narrowing of the artery. And so as this artery gradually now begins to fill up with the process of atherosclerosis, it, you begin to get calcium deposits, scar tissue in here, and the artery gradually begins narrowed. This process continues over the years, and the artery begins again more and more compromised in its ability to carry blood flow through the artery to the point that you see that it is a completely occluded so that you basically have very little blood flow. Only this tiny rim is carrying now blood through this coronary artery. So with the process of atherosclerosis, you've had a gradual narrowing of the arteries. And this process, which takes several years, gives you symptoms in the areas where the artery has been narrowed. So if we look at four major sites where the arteries may get narrowed, of which undoubtedly several of you have uh, uh, heard of individuals that have had the various problems, you can have narrowing of the arteries connected with the heart. You can have narrowing by the process of atherosclerosis of arteries leading to the brain, and also narrowing of the artery in the leg. And if we now look at the heart, basically the heart has a series of blood vessels which supply its blood supply to the heart just like any other muscle has. And the heart really is just a typical muscle that requires a blood supply and is dependent upon that blood supply even though it itself is pumping the blood around the body. So these are the two major coronary arteries that are shown here that are supplying the blood to the heart. Well, as you've seen, if we would then narrow a artery and obstruct the blood flow in the heart, we would gradually get an area which has been deprived of its oxygen supply, and you would get an area which did not have enough oxygen, and you would basically have what is called a heart attack. If that is, is in a complete occlusion, as we saw in the final uh, set of four uh, composites, then you can have an area where the muscle has actually died, and a heart attack or a coronary thrombosis are basically an obstruction of the blood supply to the, to the heart 
through the process of atherosclerosis. If we now would take and put dye in one of the coronary arteries, we, you can actually see a narrowing in a coronary artery by the process of atherosclerosis, or what's called a plaque. And you can see this is now the coronary artery, which is coming down here, which is filled with a contrast material, and basically the heart is sitting here. And you can see by this arrow the, the point where the artery has been narrowed by an occlusion uh, or a partial occlusion by the process of uh, atherosclerosis. So if a blood vessel uh, to the heart has been narrowed, basically the symptoms you get, as you well know, are uh, pains in the heart called angina. And when that artery becomes significantly compromised, you have a heart attack or a coronary thrombosis. Now if the vessel that is principally narrowed is one in the leg, this process can occur very gradually, and you get the symptoms when the individual is walking, where they get pain in their leg, and if they stop for two or three minutes, the pain will go away, and you get what's called intermittent claudication. That is, again, the problem is due to the fact that you can't get enough blood supply through to the leg, and as the muscle needs more oxygen as you're walking, it will require more oxygen, you can't deliver it, and you'll get pain, which is Basically, the muscle is telling you that you don't have enough oxygen going to it. Now, this process is a very slow one, as we've uh, talked about. And what happens, the reason that this leg doesn't die, is that you gradually have an increase in what are called collateral vessels because this process occurs very slowly. And you get vessels which will transport the blood around uh, the blockage. If you have this blockage acutely, such as if you would throw a blood clot into your leg, you don't have the, the time for collaterals develop, and that's why that basically the limb then is in great peril, because you've not had the long process where the collateral circulation will occur, and therefore it, with an acute obstruction of an artery, uh, it has to really be removed or you'll lose your leg. If you look now again with an x-ray and look at the vessel, this is the bone and this is the leg, here is basically uh, the vessel which is uh, going down here and continuing on here. And you'll see that the contrast material basically doesn't really get there to there except by very fine coll collaterals which are getting the blood supply further on down the leg. So that if the process of atherosclerosis affects the limb principally, you get symptoms of pain in the legs, uh, particularly on exercise, and it's again due to the same process. The similar process uh, in the uh, cerebral vessels, and this is a vessel leading to the brain, you can have a gradual obstruction uh, of the vessels, and these are uh, the, the carotid vessels leading to the brain. And the symptoms that you get from that are a stroke. These may be the large vessels here in the neck or the smaller vessels up in the brain. Again, if you look at an x-ray, and you can see at this point right here that there's a significant uh, obstruction right here where this vessel should be going right out here. Again, you have a significant narrowing of the vessel at this point in uh, the arteries which are leading uh, to the brain. So the process of atherosclerosis is a generalized one. There may be more symptoms related to the heart in one individual or symptoms related to the leg or to the brain in another individual. But basically, the process is the same, and the symptoms really relate to the artery and what it's supplying of what symptoms the individual will mention. Well, this has really taken us now through a, a large number of different studies uh, over the years, which have really delineated the process of atherosclerosis and the symptoms that you get. And obviously, it's become a very important question over the years, is can we pick out as individuals or in groups of individuals types of things which will increase the risk of developing cardiovascular disease in the form of atherosclerosis? That is, are there risk factors for the development of atherosclerosis so that you have uh, those particular risk factors, your chances of developing cardiovascular disease are greater than individuals uh, who don't have the risk factors? And there's really two parts to this question. One is, can we identify the risk factors? And second is, if we change those risk factors, can we clearly change the chances of a given individual of having, let's say, a heart attack uh, if we change the risk factors. 
Now, a lot of different studies over the years have, have now clearly delineated that if you take a group of individuals and look at individuals that have premature cardiovascular disease, and premature is individuals who have heart attacks before the ages of, let's say, 64, 65. Many individuals will have heart attacks uh, uh, in their 40s, and I'm sure that you're all aware of the executive type who didn't, uh, has been getting along without any problems and has a heart attack at age 45. And basically, a number of studies uh, in a number of different centers across the country have identified now three risk factors which are clearly associated with the development of cardiovascular disease at an earlier age than people normally get cardiovascular disease, since it is a disease in many ways of old age that everyone gets it after a period of time. But the question is, how soon do you get it? The three risk factors that have now been identified are shown here. One is the cholesterol level in the plasma. And it's important in actually all three of these risk factors to note on the vertical axis is the incidence of cardiovascular disease per 100,000 population. That it is a graded risk factor, that there's no such thing as having one level where you're okay, and when you step over a magic line, that you have a high cholesterol and therefore have a greater risk. But this is a gradual increase in risk as your cholesterol goes uh, higher and higher. The same is true of the second major risk factor, and that's blood pressure. Again, your blood pressure is not normal or abnormal, but your incidence of cardiovascular disease gradually increases as a function of how high in the, uh, your blood pressure becomes. Again, smoking, I think there's been a lot of publicity, uh, particularly in relationship to cigarette smoking and lung disease. But smoking is a very potent risk factor also for the development of cardiovascular disease. And just as it is in terms of the uh, risk of developing uh, lung tumors with the, the, the amount that you smoke, also that's true for the development of cardiovascular disease as a function of smoking. So we basically have three major risk factors now which can clearly be identified that individuals that have these have a higher incidence of cardiovascular disease than those who do not have them and that they're graded risk factors. Now, as we've reviewed for years, it was thought that, that uh, the cholesterol level was basically uh, a cholesterol uh, factor which was always a negative one. And if the highest cholesterol that you get, the higher cholesterol, the more and more of a risk that you have for the plasma cholesterol. And this is particularly true, as we now have reviewed, for the LDL cholesterol. So that if you have a higher and higher level of LDL cholesterol, you will have a greater chance of developing cardiovascular disease. On the other side of the coin is the HDL cholesterol. The higher the HDL cholesterol in epidemiological studies have, have suggested that HDL cholesterol, in this sense, is a negative risk factor, and the higher your HDL is, the less cardiovascular disease that you have. And you really have now the extremes of LDL and HDL. Individuals who have a disease called familial hypercholesterolemia and have very high levels of cholesterol, and cholesterol levels that range between 800 and 1,000, will have heart attacks when they're 10, 12, or 14 years of age. Individuals who have high levels of HDL cholesterol, which are called now long livers, uh, have uh, a syndrome which appears to be a longevity syndrome where they're octogenarians and they have high levels of HDL cholesterol and they appear to be protected from cardiovascular disease, at least as, as appears to be associated with this risk factor. So it becomes apparent now that before an individual who has a cholesterol level, before he decides what he should do with that, it's now important to know whether the cholesterol level is attached to the LDL lipoproteins or the HDL lipoprotein. As you might uh, have anticipated, that there is an enormous amount of work uh, going on at the NIH and several other laboratories around the country to try to figure out how we can raise HDL in individuals. Women have a higher level of HDL than men do. And, this, uh, and they are pr protected against cardiovascular disease until the menopause. And they also have higher levels of HDL cholesterol than men do. 
So that uh, the HDL cholesterol has been uh, the point of interest now of a variety of laboratories because uh, as drugs can now begin to control LDL and HDL cholesterols, we must distinguish between the two since one appears now to be a positive risk factor whereas the other appears to be a negative risk factor. Now, the three major risk factors as we've delineated is an elevated serum cholesterol, and particularly now LDL cholesterol, elevated blood pressure, and cigarette smoking. If you're an average 45 or 50-year-old man and, ha and smokes one pack of cigarettes a day, has elevated blood pressure, is defined as having a systolic and diastolic above 140 over 90, and has a cholesterol level that's greater than 250, you have a nine times greater chance of developing a heart attack than someone who doesn't have those three risk factors. If you have a upper limit of normal of blood pressure, an upper limit of normal of cholesterol, and smoke a pack of cigarettes a day or more, you have a five times risk of developing cardiovascular disease. So that the major question that obviously has been addressed by a large number of people is can we change these risk factors and therefore change a, an individual's chance of developing cardiovascular disease? Now the elevated serum cholesterol has, a, has attracted a great deal of attention, I think, as you're all aware, and has become a very hot topic both now that we've learned there's, quote, good and bad cholesterol and also what is the effect of cholesterol, as this uh, portly individual shows here, eating his ice cream cone, the question is, will lowering of cholesterol in an individual at a point in time affect the possibility of his development of cardiovascular disease? We now have drugs and diets that will clearly lower cholesterol, but will it do uh, a given individual any good? And that's a question that is still a major one and a, a question that still has a great deal of controversy uh, surrounding it. I think as we've reviewed now, you'll see that uh, since this is a long-term process, number one, and two, that there may be multiple causes for the development of atherosclerosis. Whether you change one risk factor, will you significantly change it? And when you decide to change it, depending upon how much of the artery has reached a point which it cannot change, are major questions which make the question of Will lowering cholesterol make any difference? A very difficult one to answer. Now, the evidence that is available is really uh, incomplete, but in two general areas. One is studies related to the human, and other are experimental studies. It's very clear in, from an epidemiology point of view that certain uh, groups around the world have a great deal more cardiovascular disease than other groups. For example, people in Finland who have uh, one of the highest intakes of saturated fats and cholesterol have a very high level of cardiovascular disease as compared to Japanese individuals who only have about 10% the level of uh, cardiovascular disease in terms of myocardial infarctions as the Finnish individuals and their cholesterol levels are 140 versus roughly about 280 for the two populations. So as you go around the world, you can see different areas which have different dietary intakes, which clearly have different incidences of cardiovascular disease. And a particularly interesting study was done where they took Japanese individuals and looked at them as they basically became more westernized, living in Hawaii and then on the west coast. Their diets changed, their cholesterol and fat intake increased, and their incidence of cardiovascular disease became more and more like the individuals uh, in the United States, that their level of cardiovascular disease clearly increases as at least their dietary uh, changes occurred. The second level of investigation uh, of changing cholesterol levels and saying basically will it change the incidence of cardiovascular disease are now a few studies which have been done on individuals with uh, the familial hypercholesterolemia, as I mentioned, those are the ones that have cholesterols as high as 800 to 1,000. They have had their, their cholesterols lowered, and studies done in England and in uh, Colorado uh, would suggest by using coronary arteriography that with the lowering of cholesterol and using the criterion of changes in the uh, degree of narrowing of coronary arteries as studied by coronary angiography, 
that the vessels become less narrowed after a prolonged period of time uh, in which the cholesterol uh, level is low. The third series of studies are really related to animal studies, and animal studies in which they have taken, in this case, um, monkeys, given them a very high cholesterol and fat diet, in this case for 17 months. And this is a picture, uh, which now I think you're familiar with, and this is a coronary artery that is significantly narrowed with the process of atherosclerosis. They took then a group of these animals and put them on a low cholesterol diet and for the next 40 months and then looked at their arteries. And the coronary artery at that time period was significantly more open to the transport of blood through it. If they took an artery and looked at it in terms of one of the leg arteries, again, it was very severely occluded after the high cholesterol diet and after putting them on the lower cholesterol diet, again, the level of uh, opening appeared to be significantly greater. But I think this is still a major area of controversy, whether diet will, in fact, change the incidence of a given individual if he changes his diet. And I think right now the NIH is supporting several studies, uh, both in the intramural program and around the country, to basically answer this question. But it's going to take years before we can really come up with a definitive answer, and it will be very difficult, as you can see, because of the multifactorial cause of atherosclerosis and the narrowing, and also the long period of time that the disease takes uh, to develop. The second risk factor is elevated blood pressure, and what can a given individual do to change uh, his blood pressure if, indeed, he does have elevated blood pressure? Well, elevated blood pressure is somewhat easier in that the individual who has high blood pressure, the drugs are very effective for lowering blood pressure, and again, the dietary changes can be significant. The average American uh, takes in approximately 12 grams of salt a day. It clearly should be reduced in terms of blood pressure, as far as we know now, to approximately about 5 grams, and if you have high blood pressure, it should be lowered to approximately 2 grams a day. So again, dietary changes can affect the level of blood pressure, and we have very good uh, drugs now for affecting a return of the blood pressure in the individual to a normal level. Now, studies have been shown clearly now to indicate that changing the blood pressure of an individual from a high level to a normal level can clearly affect the incidence of strokes that, that is still being accumulated for the development of myocardial infarction or heart attacks. But it clearly does change the stroke. The third is smoking, and as I mentioned, smoking uh, is not uh, only a risk factor for the development of uh, lung disease, but it clearly is a factor in relationship to development of cardiovascular disease. An individual who is 45, and as the studies have been done, would suggest that you are at, at having basically twice the risk if you only have this one risk factor and smoke a pack of cigarettes a day, that you're about to have twice the risk of developing a heart attack uh, than if you're a non-smoker. So again, one thing that's relatively easy to prescribe to individuals, but it, as you well know, is very difficult to do, is to stop smoking. So that those three major risk factors, we can clearly take a positive approach as an individual to change them and the Clearly, the data is as yet not clear whether or not we will totally change the development of a given individual, his chances of cardiovascular disease. The other factor is the gradual increase in weight that Americans have. And basically, from the age of about 20 to 25 to age 50, we put on one extra pound per year. And by the time we are approximately 50, we have 25 extra pounds of weight. So as this individual shows, he's eating his ice cream cone and has high cholesterol and indeed is not, does not have ideal body weight. And clearly, the average American uh, needs to watch the calories and also not only to change what he's eating from all the information we have, but also develop an exercise program so that uh, you will have a return to the ideal body weight and get rid of the 25 pounds that you've picked up from 25 to 50. And instead of watching the world go by, you clearly should get in the point where you are jogging like the other people are on the highways and develop an exercise program not only to 
uh, change your weight to the ideal body weight, but you also get an increase in your HDL cholesterol and it lowers the triglycerides and it helps maintain ideal body weight. So you have to basically uh, develop a program where the ideal body weight of the individual is established and maintained. Individuals who are uh, obese clearly have, it's more work for the heart, it's harder to control blood glucose, your lipids are higher, and with a program of appropriate caloric restriction and changing the diet to a cholesterol diet, as we saw on the first slide of approximately 300 milligrams uh, uh, per day and having the fat content be approximately a third of the calories and developing an exercise program. You can lower the lipids. You clearly will make it easier uh, to control blood glucose problems, which become more and more a problem as an individual gets lower. You will lower the triglycerides and you will raise the HDL level. When this was done in a series of physicians at Stanford and they looked at the levels of HDL cholesterol, since it's now a negative risk factor for the development of cardiovascular disease, and compared them to individuals who are not exercising, the runners had a significant, in all age groups, higher level of HDL cholesterol. On the average, it was 64 as compared to 43 uh, for the control individuals which were not exercising. So it's become clear now over the last few years that we can identify three major risk factors and it has become clear that we have drugs to lower cholesterol, we have drugs to lower uh, blood pressure, and we can clearly now uh, suggest that uh, changing from a being a smoking individual to a non-smoking individual uh, can clearly at this point in time be very suggestive that we will have a major reduction in the incidence of cardiovascular disease as we begin to accumulate more and more data related to these risk factors. But I think as individuals, one can see that the evidence is strong in support, uh, particularly at an early age, if these uh, three risk factors are identified and corrected, that there may be much less cardiovascular disease in the future. Thank you. Uh. Is, there is a normal test taken that identifies the cholesterol level and the triglyceride level. Now, is there a normal blood test that will identify the HDLs and the LDLs? Yeah, uh, basically it's, it's just a somewhat more sophisticated study which is now being done in a lot of laboratories where they take the blood sample and they will get the total cholesterol and they will also now do the cholesterol on LDL and HDL. Uh, I recall uh, reading a while back uh, a su suggestion as far as exercise, a nice long walk, 45 to 75 minutes uninterrupted. And uh, the reason they suggested that is some people do have heart attacks while jogging, plus uh, some people have damage to the legs, you know, tendons and stuff jogging. I was wondering if you could comment on uh, that other form of exercise. No, I think that that, uh, no, it's clearly a very effective method. I think the thing that I would also like to emphasize it, that tomorrow don't everybody start running out and jogging, that you clearly should uh, also uh, be well aware of your own uh, medical problems. And before you start an exercise program, you clearly should check with your physician to see the degree of exercise that you should start. The type of exercise may be not nearly as important as the way in which that, that you do exercise to, to basically get cardiac conditioning. And in fact, you can jump rope and it will give you a 10 minutes of jumping rope is the same thing as jogging for 30 minutes. So that um, if you develop a exercise program which involves walking, it may be just as effective as jogging. Jogging is not a cure-all, you can do it many different ways. Would you please comment on drugs to lower cholesterol, when they would be used, how effective, and what side effects? Certainly. Um, I think that they're to be used only after dietary manipulations. That is in the sense that if you have a high level of cholesterol and have ascertained that that cholesterol is indeed LDL, particularly if you're a female and a jogger, you may have extremely high levels of HDL and you may have an elevated cholesterol level which is due to HDL. In that sense, I would tell you to keep on doing what you're doing and not do anything. 
If you indeed have elevated cholesterol levels in the form of LDL, then I think that the dietary treatment is the initial dietary treatment, uh, should be the first line of, of therapy for that given individual. Depending upon the amount of cholesterol and triglyceride that you take in, that may be enough to normalize your cholesterol to the American, quote, normal levels. If it doesn't on a period of, let's say, for example, two months on a cholesterol diet where you're at ideal body weight with low cholesterol and in fact do have still an elevation of cholesterol, then I think the, the type of drugs that can be used are uh, really there are three major drugs that are currently employed for lowering cholesterol. Uh, you have to also distinguish whether the individual has triglycerides as well. So that uh, if you have a triglyceride elevation as well as cholesterol, then you have a different series of drugs than if you only have cholesterol. But in a word, the side effects of these drugs are really particularly with the drug Atramid, which is useful for cholesterol and triglyceride elevations, rather minor, uh, and it's a well-tolerated drug. Cholestyramine is the second drug which has a difficulty in adherence for individuals taking it because it's a little bit like sand, but there are very little side effects from it. The third drug is nicotinic acid, which initially has some side effects such as flushing, but again, no major side effects. So in general, the three major drugs that are currently employed in, by physicians in this country have, I think, in general, rather small side effects. Uh, doctor, uh, <clears throat> you mentioned uh, things which lower the cholesterol, general cholesterol, but I don't recall what you said about increasing the HDL uh, in food not necessarily drugs, and other than exercise, are there uh, dietary ways of increasing your HDL? Well, there are not a great deal of effective ways to increase HDL that we currently know. The, if individuals have a very high level of triglycerides, and if you go on a very high carbohydrate diet, you can lower your cholesterol, and if you change from a very high carbohydrate diet back to a normal diet, you will increase your HDL. But basically, as yet, we've not identified any dietary manipulations other than the changes that occur with uh, high carbohydrate diets that affect HDL levels. Estrogens will increase HDL levels, and uh, treatment of hypertriglyceridemia with nicotinic acid, for example, will increase HDL and the exercise. Is there any information if genetics plays a role in controlling the uh, blood levels of the various lipoproteins, and two, uh, does race or uh, groups of individuals, groups of people, seem to have uh, particularly high levels of HDL? The answer to your first question is certainly yes. That of the types of high cholesterol levels, that is particularly high LDL cholesterols, uh, the genetics is probably uh, a major factor. Individuals who have what is called familial hypercholesterolemia are not a small segment of our population. In studies that have been done at several centers around the country, people have one defective gene for a high level of cholesterol or, or, or heterozygous for that condition, and they are between one and 400 and one, uh, one out of 500 live births per year. So that there is a large number of individuals who will have genetically determined hyperlipidemia. That's only one form of genetically determined hyperlipidemia, and even a more common one is called combined hyperlipidemia, which again, the two incidents of that is not as yet known. But clearly, the genes uh, play a major role, just as the genes for high levels of HDL. If you can pick your parents for a high level of HDL, you obviously uh, can make a very uh, astute uh, selection. There are clearly groups of people who have high levels of HDL. In the uh, Georgian area of the Soviet Union, there are people who, quote, have high levels of HDL, uh, or they're long livers, basically, and they can have uh, what is now maybe more important than just the HDL and LDL level, but it may be the ratio between the LDL and HDL level so that there are clearly tribes uh, which also do a lot of running, which may uh, help the HDL in the 
area of Jamaica which have high levels of HDL and again they have what appeared to be a longevity syndrome. The Eskimos who eat all that blubber and continue to thrive without much of a problem also have high levels of HDL for whatever reason. There seems to be greater emphasis placed on uh, cholesterol than on the triglyceride factor. Uh, what is, can you comment on the relative significance or importance of these two? Well, I think that uh, overall it's very clear that as a risk factor that the high levels of, of cholesterol and particularly LDL cholesterol are clearly a much more potent risk factor than uh, the triglycerides are.